Section 1 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon. Life of Fenelon, Archbishop of Cambrai. Part 1 francis de solignac de le mont fenelon archbishop of cambrai was born in the castle of fenelon in perigord on the sixth of august sixteen fifty one his ancestors were equally distinguished for their bravery and their learning insomuch that his own name was said to be the ninth which had reflected literary honour on the house of salignac he had the good fortune to be taken in his childhood under the especial care of his uncle the marquis de fenelon a nobleman who united in himself the virtues of all his race and who was pronounced by the great conde to be equally fitted for the field for conversation and for the cabinet brought up under the direction of such a character and sheltered in the bosom of retirement from all society or discourse that could corrupt his tender mind fenelon from his earliest years gave promise of all the useful talents and mild graces which throughout life distinguished him and rendered him as respected as he was beloved having resolved to devote himself to the service of the church he was sent at twelve years of age to the university of cowers to commence his studies which he went to paris to finish and preached in that city when he was only nineteen years of age with the greatest success his uncle however though delighted with his youthful eloquence was too prudent and too truly religious not to tremble at the possibility of his being led away by the applause of men and tempted to make his discourses like some in the present day the vehicles of mere declamation and inflated sentiment he therefore advised him to observe silence in public and devote his private hours to study and meditation until his knowledge should be matured and he might feel himself qualified to instruct conscientiously in his sacred vocation fenelon willingly followed advice of which his own modesty and piety showed him the propriety and devoted himself silently and sedulously to the improvement of his moral and intellectual powers the two great parties that divided religious opinions at that time in france were the jesuits and the jansenists to the institution of the jesuits no other that has yet appeared in civilized society can bear any comparison in point of foresight depth of design and energy of action never was lord bacon's maxim that knowledge is power more fully exemplified than in the history of these men versed in every species of human learning they derived from it all the consideration which superior information invariably commands devoting themselves in all countries more especially to the education of youth they gained over the minds of their pupils whilst yet pliant an influence which continued almost without an exception to the latest hour of their lives careless of themselves individually there were no hardships no privations they were not willing to undergo no sacrifices they were not ready to make in order to advance the cause of science in general and to aggrandize their own order in particular they were dispersed either openly or in disguise not only throughout the civilized world but to the remotest corners of the habitable globe embracing all orders and classes of society their address and acquirements rendered them the most formidable political engine that ever existed and it was only at last by grasping at what might be termed absolute power over the human mind that they lost the influence which in the first instance their talents and learning 
and contempt of all considerations merely selfish had deservedly gained very different were the habits and doctrines of the jansenists so called from their founder jansenius bishop of ypres who by plunging into a controversy respecting the nature of grace and free will not only found no end in wandering mazes lost but laid the foundation of a dispute respecting inexplicable terms which continued throughout two centuries convulsing at intervals both the church and state of france to their very centres among the jansenists the house of arnaud stood conspicuous one of that family was abbess of port royal a convent situated in a solitary uncultivated tract of land in the neighbourhood of paris more resembling a desert than any thing could have been expected to appear so immediately in the vicinity of one of the gayest capitals in europe several of this lady's relations were also members of this community the celebrated anthony d'arnaud the two le maitre le sassi and several other persons of rank and talent retired to the same spot and spent their whole time in prayer and study the writings of many of the illustrious solitaries of port royal are to be reckoned among the ablest compositions in the french language but unfortunately they devoted their contemplations too exclusively to themes of a merely speculative nature of providence foreknowledge will and fate fixed fate free will and knowledge absolute and their sentiments too often betrayed the gloom into which unsatisfied inquiry always plunges the mind the mildness of fenelon's disposition and the sweetness of his views respecting the nature and attributes of the eternal creator of all things rendered the discouraging doctrines and immoderate severity of the jansenists particularly disagreeable to him with the jesuits on the contrary he was much pleased and remained attached to them throughout life won by their courtesy their learning and their active benevolence nevertheless he joined himself to the sulpicians a community of secular priests who far inferior in renown either to the jesuits or jansenists yet commanded universal respect by the unassuming piety with which they devoted their exertions to the service of the church in her most obscure and humble functions within which modest and useful line of duty they uniformly confined their efforts after continuing his studies for some time under the abbe tronson prior of the convent of saint sulpice fenelon was ordained priest in that seminary in his twenty-fourth year and passed the three following years in complete retirement he then at the desire of the curate of the parish of saint sulpice began to deliver a course of familiar explanations of the old and new testaments on sundays and festivals and these first made him known to the public he was shortly afterwards appointed confessor and spiritual director to a community of females who had been gained over from the protestant to the catholic faith and about the same time he formed an intimacy with the celebrated bossuet the most eloquent of french or perhaps of any orator of modern times and with the abbe de fleury a man as distinguished for the endowments of his mind as the purity of his manners in the unreserved society of these persons fenelon passed at this juncture many of his happiest hours strengthening his piety by their precepts and his virtues by their example fenelon had entertained thoughts in the beginning of his religious career of transporting himself to canada and devoting his life to the conversion of the savages but the delicate state of his health rendering it improbable that he would be able to bear the rigour of so severe a climate 
he changed his determination and resolved to dedicate himself to the missions of the east soon however a field was opened to him at home for his utmost labors by the short-sighted bigotry of louis the fourteenth that monarch on the twenty third of august sixteen eighty five absolutely and entirely revoked the edict of nantes by which henry the fourth granted to the huguenots or protestants the free exercise of their religion and placed them nearly on a level in equality of civil rights with his other subjects these unfortunate persons now seeing themselves exposed to every species of persecution and insult quitted france by thousands and dispersing themselves in the different protestant states enriched them with their arts and industry whilst they at the same time taught them to execrate the tyranny by which they were eventually to be benefited the success with which fenelon had acquitted himself of the duties of his office as a catholic priest in all matters where protestants or newly made converts were concerned made louis desirous of securing his services towards gaining over such huguenots as still remained in the kingdom the province of poitou was appointed for the scene of his labors before he entered upon them he was presented to louis the king desired him to state any wishes that he might entertain connected with his mission the only request he made was that the troops and every species of military parade might be removed far from the province of which he was to have the direction violence and persecution of any description whatsoever were not only odious but sinful in the eyes of fenelon sincerity and love were his weapons and with these arms alone he won to his way of thinking many whom no dangers could have terrified from their original faith whilst on the contrary other hapless provinces were desolated with fire and sword without being able in a single instance to shake the firmness of the wretched sufferers who nobly sacrificed both property and life rather than assent with their lips to doctrines which they could not believe in their hearts the principles on which fenelon acted himself he labored to impart more especially to those who were likely one day to have dominion over others to prince charles the son of james the second better known by the name of the pretender he earnestly recommended toleration in religious matters should he ever be restored to the throne of his ancestors no human power said he can force the impenetrable entrenchments of the freedom of the mind compulsion never persuades it only makes hypocrites when kings interfere in matters of religion they enslave instead of protecting it give civil liberty to all not by approving all religions as indifferent but by patiently permitting what god permits and by endeavouring to teach persons a right mode of thinking by mildness and persuasion soon after the return of fenelon from his successful mission into poitou he was appointed preceptor to the duke of burgundy the duke of anjou and the duke of berry the three sons of the dauphin fenelon entered upon his important office with religious solicitude regarding the happiness of millions as connected with the dispositions of his pupils the training them to virtue and especially forming the character of the eldest who was destined one day to ascend the throne of france became the subject of his most anxious thoughts his noblest ambition the duke of burgundy was one of those singular beings who appear equally qualified by nature for the most exalted virtue or the most degraded vice and whose bias depends entirely on the hand by which it may be given at the time that fenelon undertook the direction of him it must be acknowledged that the preponderance turned towards all that was unpromising 
the duke of burgundy says the duke de saint simon in his memoirs was born terrible and during his first years continued to be an object of terror to those around him hard-hearted angry to the extreme of passion even against inanimate objects impetuous to a degree of fury incapable of bearing the least opposition to his wishes even from time or climate without putting himself into paroxysms of rage that made one tremble for his existence a condition in which i have often seen him stubborn in the highest degree insatiable in the pursuit of every kind of pleasure addicted to the gratifications of the table and violent hunting delighted to a degree of ecstasy with music and with deep play in which however he could not bear to lose and by his violence made it dangerous to any one to engage with him in fine abandoned to all the passions and transported by every kind of enjoyment often ferocious naturally cruel barbarous in his raillery seizing the ridiculous with astonishing justness high as the clouds in his own opinion considering other men as atoms to which he bore no resemblance and regarding even his brothers though educated on an equality with himself only as intermediate beings between him and the rest of the human race such is the picture of this prince by one who was personally acquainted with him from his cradle happily his talents bore full proportion to his faults and under the exquisite discernment and judicious tenderness of fenelon who felt an almost parental attachment for his royal pupil and whose plans were fully entered into and aided by his coadjutors the abbe de fleury the abbe de langeron and father le valois the prince gradually became all that could be wished from the abyss which i have described says saint simon there arose a prince affable gentle moderate patient modest humble austere only to himself attentive to his duties and sensible of their great extent his only object appeared to be to acquit himself of all that might be expected of him as a son and subject and to qualify himself for his future obligations to relate the means by which fenelon accomplished so extraordinary and desirable a change in the moral nature of his pupil at the same time that he stored his mind with every species of information would be to relate a complete system of education one of the most fortunate that ever was attempted but in the present brief memoir the detail would be too minute the great secret after all of fenelon's success was his own worth his learning his piety his sincerity his disinterestedness and his independence joined to perfect consistency of conduct on all occasions commanded respect his sweetness his benevolence the courtesy of his demeanour the tenderness of his feelings the warmth of his affections the poetical cast of his imagination stored with the most delightful images all inspired love he corrected the faults of his pupil and cherished his virtues by the same means he perpetually delineated his portrait under whatever aspect it might appear in a series of the most interesting fables self-love taught the duke to seek for their very inmost meaning self-love taught him at first to correct the faults which when written down he could not bear to contemplate and the powerful bond of habit once broken through better feelings taught him to preserve that victory over himself for conscience sake which in the first instance he had attempted only for the admiration of those around him fenelon now began to reap the harvest in a worldly point of view of all his excellencies his success in the education of his pupils 
particularly in that of the duke of burgundy had rendered his name renowned throughout the kingdom and his conciliating manners had obtained him the personal regard of all who knew him louis the fourteenth presented him to the abbey of saint valery one of the richest in france and afterwards named him archbishop of cambrai he was consecrated in the chapel of saint cyr in the presence of madame de maintenon and his three royal pupils and presented the rare spectacle of merit rewarded without envy or malice endeavouring to subtract from its deserts the time was however rapidly approaching when the very virtues of fenelon were to lead him into misfortune in every age of christianity there have always existed some individuals among different denominations of christians who have aimed at a sublime spirituality above visible objects and natural feelings and attempted by assiduous prayer and abstraction from terrestrial things to raise themselves to an intellectual contemplation of the deity and a sensible communion with him among them may particularly be distinguished the quietists as they called themselves from their considering a state of calm contemplativeness and passive abandonment of themselves to the divine will as the highest pitch of wisdom and virtue these people increased so rapidly towards the end of the sixteenth century under the influence of michael de molinos a spanish priest who resided at rome that they drew down upon themselves the censures of the pope and suffered much persecution in consequence their doctrines were for some time after kept greatly out of sight or at least expressed in very guarded language the open revival of them in the reign of louis the fourteenth originated with madame de gaillon a lady descended from a respectable family in possession of an ample fortune and gifted by nature with all that is most lovely and most captivating in the female form and mind left a widow very early in life her morals remained to her dying day without reproach notwithstanding the endeavours of her enemies to throw odium upon them having placed herself under the spiritual direction of father lacomte who had been a disciple of molinos she became tinctured with his views and having composed two works in illustration of them she traversed great part of france making everywhere friends and proselytes with inconceivable rapidity at length she arrived in paris and her graces and her eloquence soon procured her admittance to the private parties at the hotel de beauvilliers where madame de maintenon used to dine once or twice a week with the duc de beauvilliers one of the most estimable noblemen france ever knew his wife a daughter of the celebrated colbert and their own immediate connections all ceremony and pomp were banished from these social and intellectual meetings the court was excluded from them fenelon alone was admitted a constant and a valued guest in him madame de guillon found a willing hearer she descanted before him on the pure and abstract love of god for his own perfection and the exquisite bliss of a soul absorbed in the contemplation of his goodness and resigned to his will and removed alike from all considerations of hope or fear she touched a nerve of exquisite sensibility in her hearer and it vibrated through his heart which glowed within him as she spoke doctrines sublime and peaceful in themselves promulgated by a female of the first endowments sanctioned by a man so eminent as fenelon and received by madame de maintenon in the zenith of her power all but the acknowledged consort of the king of france doctrines with such advantages could not fail of becoming popular the court itself soon exhibited the singular spectacle of an assemblage of fashionable contemplatists 
waiting for pious ecstasies and beatific visions the clergy became alarmed at the prospect of a religion being diffused which struck at the root of all forms and ceremonies they pronounced it a dangerous innovation chimerical in theory subversive in practice of the true spirit of religion and leading indirectly to a frightful laxity of morals the bigotry of madame de maintenon took the alarm at such a representation and from that time she openly professed herself the enemy of quietism and of madame de guillon fenelon however remained unshaken in his attachment to both and was in consequence involved in a controversy of the most afflicting nature insomuch as he had in it for his bitterest opponent his venerable friend bossuet to whom he had for years looked up with almost filial reverence it would swell this memoir too much to enter into a minute examination of the merits of a dispute which though for eighteen months retaining complete possession of the public mind throughout france and the papal states is now never alluded to or thought of excepting to show to how much persecution a good man may be unjustly exposed and how much his goodness will enable him to endure without repining in defence of madame de guillon fenelon had written the maxims of the saints consisting chiefly of extracts from the writings of the early fathers respecting what is termed among the mystics the interior life this book though abounding with the sublimest thoughts drew down upon its author the heaviest indignities the wish to place the doctrines of the quietists in a candid point of view was confounded with an attempt to vindicate all the errors and absurdities into which too literal an acceptation of them might lead fenelon was banished notwithstanding the tears of the duke of burgundy who threw himself at the feet of his grandfather the king entreating him not to send away his beloved preceptor the royal displeasure was extended to every one who bore the name of fenelon or claimed consanguinity or friendship with him the pope himself though sitting in judgment at that time on the theological opinions of fenelon was shocked at the severity with which he was treated and exclaimed to himself with great emotion when he heard of it expulerunt nepotum expulerunt consanguineos expulerunt amicos his nephew his relations his friends they have turned them all out of doors in ecclesiastical language to be banished simply means to confine a bishop to his diocese exactly the place where he ought to be according to honest martin luther who says bishop means by the sheep signifying that one in that sacred office ought never to be far from his flock it was well for fenelon that he placed his greatest happiness in being among the people of his pasture his banishment to cambray was no banishment to him excepting as his friends were involved in his disgrace he had suffered two years to elapse without paying a second visit to court after the first where he had been received by louis with the highest marks of favour on his return from the province of poitou he who could voluntarily observe an absence of that duration was not likely to be affected by one much longer which was not of his own seeking whilst fenelon was employed at cambray in the discharge of every duty of his sacred office and the exercise of every virtue that could throw a holy radiance over the human character the storm still raged from without he was attacked on all sides chiefly by bossuet opinions were imputed to him which he had never entertained he was compelled to exonerate himself from them for the honor of religion itself he took up his pen reluctantly but it was tipped with fire and wrought conviction in the hearts of his readers at length 
his wrongs and mortifications reached their height the pope evidently against his will if not against his judgment but goaded on by the careless importunities of louis the fourteenth who felt the simplicity of fenelon's faith and the purity of his life a reproof to his own conduct in both matters at last pronounced sentence of condemnation against the maxims of the saints and particularly against twenty-three of the propositions contained in it as liable to give offence to pious ears erroneous in doctrine and pernicious in practice it was now that the character of fenelon appeared in its loveliest light he who to use the language of the chancellor d'aguesseau in a speech which president henault styles an eternal honour to his memory he who had fought like a lion in defence of his work whilst there was a chance of victory or even of not being conquered submitted in an instant like the lowliest sheep of his flock end of section one a recording by linda johnson section two of lives of the ancient philosophers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by François Fénelon. Life of Fénelon, Part Two. So implicitly did this admirable prelate bow before the reproof of him whom he acknowledged as the head of the church, reading it himself in his diocese, along with his own recantation, that his enemies would willingly have spread the idea that his acknowledgment of error was too prompt to be sincere but the general tenor of his character made it far more improbable that it should be otherwise the dislike of louis the fourteenth towards fenelon was greatly increased by the publication of the celebrated romance of telemachus written by the archbishop expressly for the instruction of the duke of burgundy the pure morality of this work the beauty of its descriptions the tenderness of its sentiments joined to its high tone of feeling gave it an irresistible charm in the eyes of all impartial judges and its merits were universally acknowledged by being translated into every language in europe but to the court it presented a very different picture they saw in it only a satire on their royal master and themselves calypso was supposed to be the marchioness de montespan eucharis mademoiselle de fontange telemachus the duke of burgundy mentor the duke of beauvilliers antiope the duchess of burgundy protesilos louvois idomeneus our king james the second and Sesostris, Louis the Fourteenth. Hence, fresh indignities were shown to Fenelon, and stabs were aimed at him in every part where he was thought most vulnerable. But with respect to injuries that affected himself alone, he might indeed be said to bear a charmed life, and long after he had felt the full measure of the haughty Bourbon's unrelenting hate, he put an apology for the faults of kings into the mouth of mentor which appeared in a subsequent edition of telemachus to follow fenelon into what the world might term retirement and deem synonymous with disgrace is to follow him into the field of his most sacred duties and the scene of his purest happiness when he acquiesced in his nomination to the archbishopric of cambray it was on the express condition that he should be allowed to reside nine months out of twelve in his diocese the permission therefore to remain there constantly however ungracious the form in which it might be conveyed was not in itself likely to be unpleasing to him 
how much more fortunate would have been our lot he had said to bossuet in one of his replies to his venerable and powerful antagonist if instead of thus consuming our time in interminable disputes we had been employed in our diocese in teaching the catechism and instructing the villager to fear god and bless his holy name fully did he prove the sincerity with which this was expressed by the zeal with which he acted up to it for fifteen years he lived in his diocese the blessing of all who came within his influence he rose early spent the first part of the morning in devotion and the remainder of it he gave to the spiritual instruction of those who came before him at noon he dined his table was spread with an elegance and plenty suitable to his rank but his own diet was spare and simple he said grace himself both before and after dinner with seriousness but without affectation his tried friend the virtuous and faithful abbe de chanteral a relation with whom he had long lived in the closest habits of friendship and to whom he had entrusted the advocating of his cause at home was invariably seated at his right hand he admitted all his chaplains to his table and on all occasions treated them with that respect himself which he wished to see them receive from others the discourse during dinner was general and strangers were struck with its ease and politeness no person says the duke de saint simon ever possessed in a higher degree than fenelon the happy talent of easy light and ever decent conversation it was perfectly enchanting his mild uniform piety troubled no one and was respected by all no one felt his superiority he placed every one on the same level with himself those who left him for a moment were impatient to return to him after dinner the company retired to a large apartment where they continued the conversation for about an hour whilst fenelon occasionally signed papers that required dispatch or gave directions to his chaplains on the affairs of his diocese he then retired to himself until nine o'clock when he supped at ten the whole of his household assembled one of his chaplains said prayers for the night when they were concluded the archbishop rose and gave his general blessing to the assembly and this solemn rite closed a day of virtuous occupation and rational enjoyment the only recreation fenelon ever allowed himself was walking in his garden or in the country amidst the beauties of nature he found his mind refreshed after the toils of business or of study and his piety invigorated the country says he in one of his letters delights me in the midst of it i find the holy peace of god oh what excellent company is god with him one is never alone in these walks he often joined the peasants sat down on the grass with them talked to them comforted them went into their cottages placed himself at table with their families and partook of their meals the laboring peasantry were at all times the objects of his tenderest regard his palace at cambray with all his books and writings being consumed by fire he bore the misfortune with unruffled calmness and said it was better that his palace should be burnt to the ground than the cottage of a poor peasant a curate complained once to him that his parishioners notwithstanding his remonstrances would dance on sunday evenings after the service was over as is the custom in catholic countries my dear friend replied fenelon neither you nor i should dance but let us leave these poor people to dance as they please their hours of happiness are not too numerous at the time that cambray was often ravaged by advancing and retreating armies during the contest for the spanish succession he one evening met a young man in great affliction 
on account of the loss of a favorite cow which was moreover the sole support of his numerous family fenelon gave him money to purchase another but the poor fellow could not cease weeping for the cow which his wife had milked and his children loved and which he feared had fallen into the hands of the enemy fenelon spoke comfort to him and pursued his way but soon after parting with him he saw a cow which from the description he had received of it he knew to be the same that was so bitterly lamented and thinking only of the joy that the sight of it again would give to the disconsolate little circle to which it belonged he drove it back himself in a dark night to the young man's cottage this says the cardinal de maury is perhaps the finest trait in fenelon's life woe to those who read it without being affected no wonder that with such feelings and such actions fenelon should have been beloved as well as revered by the poor and that long after his death they should show the wooden chair on which he used to sit when he visited them and weep to think that they should see his face no more it was not only by his own people and his own countrymen that fenelon was thus esteemed the englishmen germans and dutch whilst their troops occupied cambrai all rivalled the inhabitants in tokens of veneration for him he visited every part of his diocese in as much security as if it had been at perfect rest all distinctions of religion and sect says m de bosset all feelings of hatred or jealousy which divide nations disappeared in his presence he was often obliged to have recourse to artifice to avoid the honors which the armies of the enemy intended him he refused the military escorts which were offered him for his personal security in the exercise of his functions and without any other attendance than a few ecclesiastics he traversed the countries desolated by war his way was marked by his alms and benefactions and by the suspension of the calamities which armies bring in these short visits the people breathed in peace so that his pastoral visits might be termed the truce of god the afflictions inseparable from war called forth the exercise of all fenelon's noblest qualities charity says the duc de saint simon was among his most striking virtues it embraced equally the rich and the poor his friends and his enemies he found frequent call for the exertion of it in the crowds of sick and wounded who during the wars in flanders were carried in great numbers to cambrai he regularly visited the hospitals paid the utmost attention to the subaltern officers and lodged a considerable number of the principal officers when they were ill in his own palace like a true shepherd of christ he watched continually over their spiritual welfare the polished manners which he derived from his habits of high life won them to him and they never had reason to repent of the confidence they reposed in him in sickness or in health they always found him willing to listen to their humble confessions and anxious to replace them in the path of virtue if the lowest person in the hospital requested his attendance fenelon never refused to go to him the corporeal necessities of the soldiers were equally an object of his compassionate zeal broths meat medicines comfortable food of every description and always of the best kind were sent them in well-regulated plenty from his palace and he presided at the consultations of the physicians with the tender solicitude of a warm and generous friend it is impossible to conceive how greatly he became the idol of the military and how versailles in spite of her stern master resounded with his name it happened that the commissariat was in extreme want of corn for the troops the archbishop emptied his granaries for their subsistence and refused any remuneration 
even louis himself on that occasion became his panegyrist his charity and polite attentions extended equally to the prisoners of war as to his countrymen in all he did there was an indescribable propriety the true episcopal character appeared in it and virtue herself became more beautiful from fenelon's manner of being virtuous to the war fenelon was indebted for the great gratification of seeing once more his beloved pupil the duke of burgundy louis the fourteenth gave in seventeen o two the command of the troops in flanders to that prince who petitioned him with so much earnestness to be allowed on his way to the army to see fenelon that the monarch ashamed perhaps of refusing a request so laudable in itself consented on the express condition that their interview should be in public the duke apprised his beloved preceptor of the permission in a letter that breathed the liveliest sentiments of gratitude and esteem the meeting took place at a public dinner at the town-house of cambray but the number of eyes that were fixed upon them the consciousness they felt that every word they uttered was liable to be repeated and perhaps misrepresented and the wearisome restraints to which the etiquette of a formal assembly subjected them rendered this interview of little effect excepting as far as the eloquence of looks and the sacred sympathy that exists between souls of kindred excellence drew them together the duke took care nevertheless to testify to all present the esteem in which he held the archbishop who when dinner was over presented him with a napkin to wipe his hands the duke received it and then returned it to him saying in a voice sufficiently elevated to be heard throughout the whole room i am sensible my lord archbishop what i owe to you and you know what i am this preceptor so valuable so independent this pupil so grateful and so docile never met again excepting once for a short time but their correspondence was a treasure of profound advice on one side and of willingness and aptness to profit by it on the other the april after this interview had taken place between fenelon and the duke of burgundy the death of the dauphin brought the duke forward as the immediate heir to the throne of france and the important situation in which he stood obliging him to make an effort and throw off the reserve in which he had before veiled his virtues and his acquirements the delighted nation saw in the graceful and engaging young man who was one day to rule over them the complete model of everything that could be desired in a sovereign it may easily be imagined that fenelon the acknowledged favorite of a prince so beloved soon experienced the different light in which he was now viewed at court he remained in his beloved retirement as usual but the voice of flattery pierced his retreat on all sides though it made no impression on his ear and his levy at cambray was crowded by the very courtiers who at versailles had been the first to abandon his interests unfortunately the duke of burgundy was not permitted to realize the lofty hopes his excellencies had inspired he died in seventeen twelve regretted by the whole kingdom but above all by fenelon who lost in him the dearest object of his earthly affections a loss however to which he submitted with such pious resignation that amidst the tears of anguish which it drew forth from the frailty of afflicted nature he exclaimed would only moving a straw restore him to life i would not do it as it is the divine pleasure that he should die the eyes of this lamented young prince were scarcely closed when his grandfather the king ordered his papers to be brought him and having examined them with great attention he burned them all with his own hands among them perished all the noble and disinterested effusions of fenelon to his pupil excepting one important production entitled 
directions for the conscience of a king which happening to be in the hands of the duc de beauvilliers escaped the flames its merits however rendered it criminal in the eyes of the court of versailles and it was not until the reign of louis the sixteenth that leave could be obtained for it to be printed at paris two years after the death of his beloved pupil fenelon himself expired at cambrai of an inflammation of the chest in the sixty-fifth year of his age he died as he had lived full of humility and love lamented by all who had known him and exemplifying the mean he had always observed between prodigality and avarice by leaving behind him neither debts nor money the remembrance of his virtues was all he had to bequeath to his relatives and friends and the example of them had been so efficacious in his lifetime that all who bore his name or were admitted into intimacy with him were eminent for their good and honourable qualities in person fenelon was tall and graceful his eyes beamed with intense and holy radiance his countenance exhibited marks of severe study but was likewise distinguished by a peculiar delicacy of expression and correspondence of one feature with another like his manners it combined the most opposite traits of character but none of them contradicted the other he appeared alternately the doctor in divinity the bishop and the nobleman in conversation he was eloquent yet always natural full of wit with judgment to proportion it exactly in the degree in which it might be pleasing to the parties to whom it was addressed and possessing a singular talent of expressing intelligibly the most abstruse ideas as a preacher he was zealous to inform and patient to amend as a writer he charmed by the grandeur and delicacy of his sentiments the fertility of his genius the correctness of his taste and above all by his exquisite sensibility next to telemachus his principal work is his dialogues on eloquence in general and on that of the pulpit in particular his letters are likewise exquisitely touching and abound with profound and delicate observations his demonstrations of the existence of a god is fraught with piety and eloquence and his thoughts on the education of daughters is written with all the feeling which was so constituent a feature in his disposition and all the knowledge of the female character which his situation of confessor to a community of that sex had particularly enabled him to acquire his theological works are only partially interesting in the present day being chiefly his arguments in defence of quietism and his controversies with the jansenists but his dialogues of the dead and his abridgment of the lies of the ancient philosophers written as well as his telemachus expressly for the instruction of the duke of burgundy will always be regarded as lessons fraught with good sense and instruction in the most delightful form respecting the lives of the ancient philosophers as accompanying this memoir a few remarks may not be misplaced when it first made its appearance though under the modest title of an abridgment and indeed to be considered as a masterly sketch rather than a finished work it yet made the public acquainted in the most agreeable manner with a body of valuable information before accessible only to the learned in this respect time has no way lessened its worth many more elaborate works on the same subject have appeared but not one wherein such treasures of wisdom are offered in so concise a form every page is fraught with curious facts and valuable truths the philosophers of modern times can bring scarcely any observation into the field of morality but what has been made before them by the illustrious men whose lives are given in the ensuing pages and in seeking for our information at the fount of the ancients 
we have a chance at least of drinking from a spring unpolluted by envy or misrepresentation in offering therefore a new translation of fenelon's lives of the ancient philosophers to the public we seek only for that meed of approbation which is due to every one who in a reading age like the present endeavors to render productions which combine instruction and amusement accessible to all ranks of the community by presenting them in a form cheap portable and pleasing End of section two. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section three of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by francois fenelon section three thales thales born the first year of the thirty-fifth olympiad died in the fifty-eighth aged ninety-two years thales the milesian was of phoenician extraction and was descended from cadmus the son of agenor his parents were compelled to quit their country in consequence of the indignation which they conceived against the tyrants by whom the more wealthy classes were continually oppressed they therefore fixed their residence at miletus a town in ionia where in the first year of the thirty-fifth olympiad or six hundred and thirty-nine years before christ thales was born he it was who first acquired the honorable title of sage and to him we are indebted for the philosophy which has been styled the ionian from the country that gave him birth for some time thales was occupied with the cares of the magistracy, but after acquitting himself with the greatest credit in several of its principal offices anxiety to become acquainted with the mysteries of nature impelled him to throw off the burthen of public business and he retired into egypt at that time the seat of the sciences he there devoted several years to cultivating the acquaintance and gaining the confidence of the priests who were also the most learned men of their country he made himself acquainted with the principles of their religion and paid great attention to geometry and astronomy he attached himself to no particular master and accepting his intercourse with the priests of egypt during his sojourn in that country he was solely indebted to experience and profound reflection for the valuable ideas with which he enriched philosophy thales possessed an elevated mind he spoke little and thought much of his own interests he was negligent but those of the state excited his utmost zeal juvenal speaking of the opinion expressed by some that revenge is sweeter than life itself observes that such sentiments are very different from those of socrates chrysippus or the gentle thales et vindicta bonum vita jacundius ipsia non dicit idem nec miti thialitus ingenium is then revenge so sweet we would resign e'en life itself to purchase the delight not such thy thoughts mild chrysippus nor thine ingenious thales on his return to miletus thales lived in great solitude devoting himself almost exclusively to the contemplation of the heavenly bodies his love of wisdom induced him to prefer the tranquillity of a single life to the cares which accompany the marriage state when he was only twenty-three years of age his mother cleobulina warmly urged him to accept of an advantageous match which was proposed to him when a man is young replied thales it is too early for him to marry when he is old it is too late and between these two periods he ought not to be able to command leisure enough to choose a wife it is said however by some that thales toward the close of life married an egyptian lady who had composed several admirable works
six one day some strangers at miletus sailing by the island of gules agreed to pay a certain price to some fishermen who had just thrown their nets into the sea for whatever they might happen to take at that draught they drew up a tripod of solid gold which it is said helen had formerly when returning from troy thrown in at that place on account of an ancient oracle which came into her recollection a dispute arose between the fishermen and the strangers as to the possession of the tripod the cities to which the parties respectively belonged became interested in the discussion each supporting the claim of its own citizens they were all in consequence on the point of coming to an open rupture when it was agreed unanimously that the matter in question should be referred to the decision of the oracle they accordingly sent to delphos and the answer of the oracle was that the tripod should be given to the most wise it was therefore sent immediately to thales who dispatched it to bias the modesty of bias would not suffer him to retain it he transferred it to a third the third to a fourth and the fourth sent it to solon there is no wiser being than god said solon and with this remark he sent the tripod to delphos where it was consecrated to apollo some young men of miletos reproaching thales one day with his philosophy told him it must be of a very unprofitable nature since it had not the power of raising him above indigence thales condescended to explain to them that the reason why philosophers do not amass riches was that they held them in contempt otherwise it would be easy for them to acquire things on which they set no value it is said that thales was enabled by his astronomical observations to foresee that a particular year would be unusually productive he therefore bought up that year before they came into season the produce of all the olive trees in the vicinity of miletus the crops proved abundant and thales made a considerable profit of his bargain but he was disinterested enough to distribute all that he gained by it among the merchants of miletus whom he called together for the purpose thus proving the sincerity of his assertion that philosophers did not place their happiness in the possession of wealth thales used to thank the gods for three things that he was born a rational being rather than a brute a man rather than a woman and a greek rather than a barbarian he believed that the world was originally framed as we at present see it by an intelligent being who had never had a beginning and would never have an end thales was the first among the greeks who inculcated the doctrine of the immortality of the soul a man came to him one day to inquire whether it was possible for human beings to conceal their actions from the gods to the gods said thales not even our most secret thoughts can ever be unknown space he used to say is the most comprehensive of all things because in it all beings are contained necessity is the strongest because it compels the accomplishment of all purposes mind the swiftest because in an instant it traverses the universe and time the wisest because it penetrates all secrets but of all things free will is the most lovely and delightful he continually repeated the maxim that much speaking is no mark of superior understanding that we ought to bear our friends in mind equally in absence as when present and to succor our parents in order to have a claim on the assistance of our children that there is nothing so base as to suffer a tyrant to live to old age and that we may derive consolation in adversity from knowing that our persecutors are as unhappy as ourselves this last remark in a man so mild and benevolent as thales shows how far inferior the highest pitch of heathen virtues was to the precepts at once sublime and lowly of the christian religion which teaches us to return good for evil to forgive our enemies and to pray for those that despitefully use us 
his next precept however is more accordant with the great rule on which all christian morality turns that we ought never to do that ourselves which we should blame if done by another thales held true happiness to consist in good health moderate fortune and pursuits free from effeminacy and ignorance nothing appeared so difficult to thales as self-knowledge to him we owe that excellent precept which was afterwards engraved on a tablet of gold and consecrated in the temple of apollo know thyself a precept so fraught with materials for reflection and so sublime in its wisdom that it is styled by juvenal heaven descended and ascribed by him to the bright-haired god himself thales maintained that there was no difference between life and death being asked why in that case he did not destroy himself because replied he life or death being the same thing i have no motive for preferring one to the other thales sometimes recreated his mind with poetry and to him is attributed the invention of hexameter verse a man who was accused and with reason of adultery came one day to the philosopher and asked if he might not justify himself by making oath of his innocency is perjury a less crime than adultery inquired thales jestingly mandritus of priene who had been instructed by thales came one day to Miletus to pay him a visit and said to him what can i do o thales sufficiently to testify the gratitude i feel for all the noble precepts i have received from you when the opportunity may occur replied thales for you to instruct others let them know at the same time that it is to me you are indebted for your doctrines this acknowledgment will be in you a proof of the most praiseworthy modesty and to me the richest reward i can desire to receive thales was the first among the greeks who applied himself to the study of physics and astronomy he maintained that water was the primary principle of all things that earth was water condensed and air water rarefied that all bodies were perpetually changing and combining one with another and that at last all would be resolved into water that the universe was animated and full of invisible beings who were perpetually passing and repassing in all directions that the earth was in the middle of the universe that it revolved round its own centre which was the same with that of the universe and that the waters of the sea on which it was balanced gave it a certain impulse which was the cause of its movements the astonishing effects of the lodestone and of amber and the sympathies existing between particular substances of the same nature induced him to believe that all matter was animated the inundations of the nile he attributed to the periodical winds which blow from the north to the south retarding the waters of the river the course of which is from the south to the north and forcing them thereby to disembogue themselves upon the country to thales we owe the first predictions respecting eclipses of the sun and moon and also the first observations on the motions of these bodies he believed that the sun was a body luminous in itself and of which the bulk was a hundred and twenty times more than that of the moon that the moon was an opaque body capable of reflecting the rays of the sun only on half its surface and on this principle it was that he accounted for the various forms under which the moon appears to us he also it was who first inquired into the nature of thunderbolts the origin of the winds and the cause of thunder and lightning before his time the method was unknown of measuring the height of towers and pyramids by taking the length of their shadows at the meridian whilst the sun was in the equinox he fixed the duration of the year to three hundred and sixty-five days 
regulated the order of the seasons and limited the month to thirty days adding five days at the end of each twelve months in order to complete the course of the year according to the method he had observed to be practised in egypt to him also we owe our acquaintance with the star called ursa minor by which the phoenicians regulated their navigation one day going out to contemplate the position of the stars at some short distance from his house thales chanced to fall into a ditch an old female servant of the family immediately ran to his assistance but having extricated him she could not help saying to him laughingly why thales how is it that you who know everything that is going on in the heavens cannot see what is directly under your feet thales during all his life was held in the highest estimation and was consulted in all matters of importance croesus having entered into war against the persians advanced at the head of a numerous army on the banks of the river halles but having neither boats nor bridges in finding the river unfordable he was greatly embarrassed as to effecting a passage across it thales happened to be in the camp at that time he assured croesus that he would enable the army to cross the river notwithstanding the absence of both boats and bridges he accordingly set the men to work immediately in digging a deep trench in the form of a crescent which extended from one extremity of the camp to the other by this means the river was divided into two arms each of which was fordable and the army was consequently enabled to pass over without any difficulty during this war croesus was very anxious to make an alliance with the milesians but thales would never consent to it and his prudence ultimately secured the preservation of his country for cyrus having conquered the lydians sacked all the towns which had joined in confederacy with them but spared Miletus because it had taken no active part against him when far advanced in years thales one day gave orders to be carried upon a terrace and placed there in order that he might witness at his ease the combats of the amphitheatre unfortunately the excessive heat brought on so violent a revulsion in his blood that he suddenly expired on the spot whence he was surveying the combats this was in the fifty-eighth olympiad and the ninety-second year of his age his funeral obsequies were graced by the Miletians with the most magnificent honors that their respect for him could devise. End of section 3。section 4 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. lives of the ancient philosophers by francois fenelon section four solon part one solon born in the third year of the thirty-fifth olympiad praetor at athens in the third year of the forty-fifth olympiad died at the beginning of the fifty-fifth aged seventy-eight years solon was born at salamis in the thirty-fifth olympiad or six hundred and thirty-seven years before christ his parents were athenians his father exochestides was descended from codrus the last king of athens and his mother was cousin german to the mother of pisastrus he employed a part of his youth in travelling into egypt at that time the grand theatre of the learned world having made himself fully acquainted with the form of government and everything relative to the laws and customs of the country he returned to athens where his uncommon merit and distinguished birth procured for him the highest offices in the state solon possessed great wisdom combined with vigor firmness and sincerity he was an excellent orator and poet an able legislator and a brave soldier 
during the whole of his life he exhibited the most lively zeal for the liberty of his country a hatred of tyranny and an indifference for the aggrandizement of his own family he never any more than thales attached himself to any particular master he neglected the investigation of physical causes in order that he might devote his whole attention to the moral and political condition of man he was the author of that excellent maxim observe moderation in all things solon was induced by the great reputation of thales to undertake a journey to miletus in order to see him one day being in familiar conversation with the philosopher he said to him i am astonished thales that you never chose to marry you might have had children whose education would have been a source of the greatest pleasure to you thales made no reply at the moment but some days after he got a man whom he had instructed in his design to come in as a stranger just arrived from athens well said solon what news none that i know replied the stranger except indeed the burial of a young athenian whose funeral was attended by the whole city for he was a youth of distinguished rank and a son of a man who was held in the greatest estimation by the people his father has been away from athens some time and his friends are resolved to conceal this afflicting event from him for they are afraid that his grief might prove actually fatal to him unfortunate father replied solon do you know his name i have heard it frequently replied the pretended stranger but at this moment i cannot call it to mind i only know that he is said by every one to be a man of extraordinary wisdom solon became more and more uneasy every instant his countenance changed and at last he could not forbear inquiring if the name was solon yes that is the name exclaimed the stranger as if suddenly recollecting it solon overcome with the most acute and violent grief began to rend his clothes to tear his hair and beat his breast and in short abandon himself to all the excesses usually given way to by those who are overwhelmed with affliction of what avail is all this lamentation said thales this weeping for a loss which all the tears in the world cannot restore alas exclaimed solon that is the very cause of all my tears i weep an evil that is without the possibility of remedy at last thales could not help laughing at the fantastic gesticulations into which solon threw himself o oh, solon said he to him oh my friend you now know what it is that has always made me afraid of marrying i dread the yoke of matrimony and i learn by the grief of the wisest men that the firmest heart is not proof against the afflictions which may spring from love and parental affection grieve however no longer for all that you have heard is only a fiction invented for the purpose of affording us amusement a dispute concerning the island of salamis had for a long time involved the athenians and megarians in a destructive warfare with each other at length after considerable loss on both sides the athenians who certainly had the worst of it weary of shedding blood made a decree that whosoever should be hardy enough to propose a renewal of the war in order to recover salamis at that time in possession of the megarians should pay the forfeit of life to his temerity solon was afraid of speaking lest he should expose his personal safety to hazard but he was equally afraid of remaining silent lest he should endanger the interests of his country he therefore resolved to counterfeit madness in order that under the plea of disordered intellect he might be privileged to act and speak as he might think fit he soon found means to get it circulated throughout the city that he had been deprived of his reason having composed some verses in the elegiatic measure and committed them to memory he set out from his own house dressed in coarse clothes all in rags with a cord about his neck and a greasy old cap upon his head 
then proceeding to the stone from which it was usual to utter proclamations he mounted it and contrary to his custom recited his own poetry would that the gods had so ordained it he exclaimed that athens had never been the place of my nativity would that i had been born in Phologondros, in sicinus or in some still more barbarous and frightful spot then at least i should not have known the grief of seeing myself pointed at with the finger of scorn and of hearing it said behold an athenian who has basely survived the loss of salamis oh let us quickly avenge the affront that has been put upon us and regain possession of the delightful abode which our enemies so unjustly withhold from us so forcible was the impression made on the minds of the athenians by this address that they immediately revoked the edict they had issued took up their arms once more and resolved again to attack the megarians solon was appointed to command the troops he embarked them in fishing boats attended by a galley of thirty-six oars and anchored very near salamis the megarians who were in the town took the alarm and ran to arms in great disorder they sent one of their own vessels to ascertain the cause of their fears but approaching too near it was captured by solon who immediately put in chains the megarians by whom it was manned and supplied their places with the bravest of his athenians these he commanded to sail to salamis and to keep themselves out of sight as much as they could he then took with him the rest of his troops effected a landing in another part of the island and went in pursuit of the megarians who had fled to the fields and whilst he was attacking them those whom he had sent with the vessel arrived and made themselves masters of the town solon having thus defeated the megarians set at liberty without any ransom the prisoners whom he had taken in the engagement and erected a temple in honour of the god mars on the spot where he had gained the victory the megarians notwithstanding this repulse still continuing some time after to make obstinate though useless attempts for the recovery of salamis it was at length agreed by all parties that the matter should be referred to the lacedaemonians for a final decision solon proved to the deputies from sparta that phileus and eurylus children of ajax king of salamis had settled at athens and had given the athenians the island in question on condition that they themselves should be made citizens of athens he caused a number of tombs to be opened in order to show that the people of salamis turned the faces of their dead to the same quarter as was observed by the athenians namely to the west whereas the megarians turned them to the opposite quarter the east and that the name of the family to which the deceased belonged was engraved on the coffin a custom practised by the athenians only the people of megara were not long however without their revenge deadly feuds had subsisted for many years between the descendants of cylon and those of megacles and at this time they were carried to a height that seemed to threaten the city with inevitable destruction cylon had formerly endeavoured to make himself master of the sovereignty of athens his design was discovered and he and many of his accomplices were massacred those who could effect their escape took refuge in the temple of minerva megacles who was then archon or chief magistrate by fair words and specious representations persuaded the delinquents to present themselves before the judges holding in their hands one end of a thread of which the other was attached to the altar of the goddess in order that they might still retain their claim on the temple for an asylum unfortunately as they were descending the steps the thread broke and megacles pretending to construe the accident into a sign that the goddess refused them her protection laid hands on several of them who were immediately stoned by the people and even those who had regained the altar were almost all without distinction put to death only a few being spared and restored to liberty at the intercession of the wives of the magistrates so black a crime rendered both the magistrates and their descendants from that time odious to the people 
the descendants of cylon in the course of time became extremely powerful and the hatred subsisting for so many years between the parties daily increased solon being at that time magistrate and fearing that their contentions might involve the whole city in ruin gained the consent of both parties to suffer their disputes to be decided by arbitration the judges gave their opinion in favor of the descendants of cylon the posterity of megacles was therefore banished and the bones of their dead dug out of their graves and scattered beyond the athenian territories to the megarians these divisions afforded a favorable opportunity of renewing their attacks they took up arms when the tumults were at their height and succeeded in recovering salamis scarcely was this sedition appeased when another arose which threatened no less danger in its consequences the poorer classes being greatly involved in debt were continually getting adjudged as slaves to their creditors who sold them or made them labor according to their pleasure a great number of these poor citizens at length assembled together and resolved to choose a leader who might prevent for the future their being treated as slaves in case of their debts not being paid at the day appointed and also to oblige the magistrates to make an equal division of the wealth of the state as lycurgus had done at sparta the discontents arose to such a height and the minds of the seditious were so inflamed that the higher orders were at a loss for means of appeasing them at length solon was applied to by consent of both parties in order to bring the disputes to an amicable termination it was not without reluctance that solon took upon himself so responsible an office and it was only his desire to serve his country that at last induced him to accept it he had been frequently heard to say that equality prevented all disputes each party construed this axiom in favor of itself the poor expected that he would place all men on an equal footing the rich on the contrary imagined that he would proportion all his distributions according to the birth and dignity of the individuals thus all ranks interpreting his sentiments according to their own wishes were so disposed to be satisfied with him that they pressed him to accept of the sovereign power even those who were not personally interested in the disputes unable to suggest a more effectual means of reconciling them willingly consented to receive as their master one who was esteemed not only as the wisest but also the best of men solon however showed at once his repugnance to the proposal and declared that nothing should ever induce him to comply with it his most attached friends could not forbear blaming him on this occasion you are very foolish said they to him why should you because there is an odium attached to the empty name of tyrant refuse a monarchy which would eventually be your legitimate right was not timondus declared king of euboea and does not pittacus at this time reign at Medellin? solon however still maintained his ground and declared publicly that nothing should make him change his opinion lawful dominion and absolute power are very fine things to be sure replied he but he who accepts them is surrounded with snares on every side which once entangled among he has no chance of escaping no arguments could prevail upon him to profit by the favorable disposition of the people towards him and his friends were forced to content themselves with setting him down for a fool or a madman solon meanwhile applied himself sedulously to settle the differences which continued to disturb athens he began by a decree that all debts contracted up to that period should be cancelled and that the debtors should be liable to no demand whatsoever on account of them in order to set an example to the public he remitted a debt of seven talents due to himself as his father's heir and to prevent the recurrence of similar inconveniences from the same source he declared all such debts as might be contracted on bodily security to be null and void these regulations at first gave satisfaction to neither party 
the rich were discontented because they were deprived of what they considered to be their lawful right and the poor were no better pleased because they were not admitted to share in the possessions of the rich nevertheless in the end all ranks were so fully convinced of the wisdom of solon's regulations by the beneficial effects of their results that they made choice of him afresh to settle the differences that arose between three factions by which athens was split into parties and vested him with complete power to reform the laws accordingly as his judgment might dictate and to establish such a form of government as he might think best the inhabitants of the mountainous parts of the country wished that the administration of affairs should rest with the great body of the people those of the low country pretended on the contrary that it would be managed best by a limited number of the most considerable citizens whilst the inhabitants of the sea-coast advocated a mixed form of government in which an equal number of magistrates should be chosen from both ranks of the people solon being now chosen sovereign arbiter of all the reigning differences began by abrogating on the account of their excessive severity all the laws of his predecessor draco under whose administration the slightest offences and the most enormous crimes were punished indiscriminately with death insomuch that it was no less dangerous to be convicted of idleness or of pilfering fruit or vegetables than to commit sacrilege murder or any other crime accounted most infamous hence arose the saying that the laws of draco were written in blood being asked why he had thus allotted death to every offence without distinction he replied because the least fault deserves that punishment and i know of none more severe for the most enormous crimes solon divided the people into three classes according to the property of each individual at the time he admitted all the people into the direction of public affairs except mere artisans who lived by their labor they were excluded from public offices and did not enjoy the same privileges as the other citizens the principal magistrate he decreed should always be selected from among the citizens of the first class solon also ordained that he who in any public tumult should remain perfectly neutral should be accounted infamous that if a man should contract marriage with a rich heiress and should be convicted of impotency his wife should be at liberty to form any connection that might be agreeable to her among his immediate relations that women should bring to their husbands no other dower than three robes and a few articles of furniture of moderate value that an adulterer taken in the act might be put to death with impunity he also limited the expenses of women of condition and abolished a number of ceremonies which they had been in the habit of observing he prohibited speaking ill of the dead and permitted persons who had no children to leave their property to whomsoever they pleased provided they were of sane mind at the time of making their testaments he ordained that he who had dissipated his property should be accounted infamous and be deprived of all his privileges in the same manner as one who should refuse to support his parents in their old age he decreed however that the son who had not been taught whilst young any means of getting his own livelihood should not be compelled to maintain his father that no foreigner should be admitted as a citizen of athens unless banished for ever from his native country or unless he came with all his family to athens for the purpose of exercising some profession here he reduced the rewards usually assigned to the athlete or wrestlers and decreed that the children of those who had fallen in battle for their country should be educated at the public cost that a guardian should not live under the same roof with the mother of his wards and that the next heir should never be chosen in the capacity of guardian that all theft should be punished with death and that he who should cause the loss of an eye to another should be condemned to lose both his own these laws of solon were all engraved on tablets 
the members of the council met together in assembly and bound themselves by oath to observe them and to cause them to be strictly observed by others those also to whom the care of them was confided solemnly swore that in case of any one of them failing in his duty he should be obliged to present to the temple of apollo a statue of gold of equal weight with himself and judges were also established to interpret the laws whenever any dispute respecting their precise meaning might arise among the people one day while solon was framing his laws anacharsis rallied him on his undertaking what said he do you flatter yourself that you will be able to repress the injustice and passions of men by written injunctions such decrees added he in fact are like spider webs they only entrap flies all men set a value replied solon on those things which immediately concern themselves my laws shall be so organized that the citizens shall find their interest more concerned in the observance than the violation of them he was asked why he had made no law for the punishment of parasites because said he i never could bring myself to believe that any one could ever be so utterly depraved as to kill his father or his mother end of section four